Professor Jeffrey Deaton for the uh, uh, Institute of Energy Efficiency Seminar. Uh, Jeff is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley in the physics department, and he is also the director of the Molecular Foundry at uh, Berkeley, uh, which is uh, associated with the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, where he's also a, a st senior staff scientist, I guess senior faculty scientist now. Um, Jeff did his PhD at um, Cornell University where he worked with Neil Ashcroft, uh, known to all of us from uh, the famous book. So it must have been quite a privilege to uh, have that interaction. Um, then he moved on to a postdoc position at Rutgers University where he worked uh, also with people who are familiar to, to many of us, uh, David Vanderbilt and Karen Gray. Uh, and then he uh, went to Berkeley where he uh, has held various positions uh, until most recently uh, now the director of the Molecular Foundry. Uh, he's received a number of awards, Presidential Early Career Award, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, Outstanding Achievement Award, etc. Um, he's also a fellow of the American uh, Physical Society. Uh, Jeff is a theorist. Uh, but he, well, I'm a theorist by, myself, and uh, I, Jeff is the sort of theorist that I think sh theorists should be like, namely somebody who doesn't just do calculations or theory, but actually works on real life problems, um, on things that have applications in, in, within technology, and he's proven extremely proficient at actually addressing important, important problems. And I'm sure this will uh, emerge during his talk today, uh, which will be about charge transport and energy conversion at the nanoscale. Please join me in welcoming Jeff. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Um, and uh, Chris, that was a really terrific introduction. Of, uh, um, I, I, I'm hoping to live up to that. Uh, um, uh, uh, terrific to be here in Santa Barbara. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll tell you a little bit today um, about some things that we're doing, um, have been doing at the Molecular Foundry, where I've been um, a staff scientist and now the director for the um, uh, past 10 years or so, and now also in, in the physics department at Berkeley, um, and a new nanoscience institute at Berkeley that we have uh, sponsored by the uh, Kavli uh, Foundation. And um, one of the, I'll be telling you uh, some of the work that our group is doing in the area of uh, developing charge, uh, looking at charge transport phenomena uh, at the nanoscale with sort of techniques that uh, are empirical parameter free um, and can maybe provide some additional insight that complements experiments and uh, leads to, to predictions in this, uh, of, of such phenomena. Uh, and so before I, I start, I think as as Chris mentioned, it, it is sort of something that is central to the research is to, to keep uh, you know, close to experiment. And so we have a, I have a fair number of collaborators, and I wanted to acknowledge the collaborators and the funding. And so first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, a lot of experiments of my collaborators at Columbia, um, including Latha Venkataraman, um, and also some collaborators that are close to, to you guys. Uh, uh, Rachel Siegelman's now, you, you guys uh, uh, stole her from us so uh, at Berkeley, and uh, uh, some of the collaborations we're doing with her, Michael and Guy. Uh, and, uh, and some of the theory work that we're doing continues in collaboration with Stephen Louie and Lior Kronick. Uh, and so my group here, uh, uh, those among, these are some of the members of the group that I'll be, whose work I'll be speaking about, and I'll come back to some of them as, the pro as I describe the projects. Uh, uh, Michelle Kachuga and Jen Fei Lu uh, and Marco Bernardi are, are really the key players in what I'm going to talk about um, in a little bit. Um, and so I think as, as uh, Chris uh, said, sort of as an overview slide, and since we're, uh, this is an energy efficiency seminar, um, I wanted to emphasize that you know, for, for me, you know, we do our group and, and my interests are really uh, uh, in fundamental problems. Uh, and materials and phenomena, and we're going to focus on transport here, uh, but we're very much inspired by this energy context, by energy materials context, but by both um, you know, energy applications and also maybe the next generation of materials that could be useful for energy applications. Uh, those kinds of materials, uh, uh, organics, 
hybrid materials involving inorganics and organics and oxides. Those are classes of materials that are really chemically diverse, structurally heterogeneous, uh, you know, really quite complex. Uh, and those, uh, those are materials in which you know, one would like to be able to uh, a kind of uh, a design or structure in ways to you know, optimize efficiency of uh, thermoelectrics, uh, solar cells, uh, uh, or uh, uh, sort of other kinds of energy storage uh, media photo, uh, uh, relevant to solar to fuels or, or batteries. Um, and uh, in these spaces, because of the chemical diversity, uh, structural uh, diversity, um, the design space is large. Um, and we kind of would like to have rules that connect you know, our, our intuition principles, uh, design principles that connect you know, the, the, the sort of uh, phenomena that are fundamental to efficiency, like transport phenomena, uh, absorption of light, um, uh, electrochemical behavior, uh, to you know, local chemical uh, and structural features. And that's something that you know, kind of really requires some ab initio uh, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, insight. Uh, and so that's the, this is kind of the space that, that inspires us. And I mentioned, and now in each of these uh, applications, thermoelectrics and uh, solar cells and, and also photocatalysts, electric, electrocatalysts and batteries, a real central um, phenomenon that governs efficiency of these devices um, and you know, kind of is you know, criteria for the uh, efficacy of a material uh, for any of these applications is transport. Um, and so that's an area where, uh, which is really kind of a non-equilibrium phenomenon uh, that is sort of not, uh, you know, with common and standard techniques of theory, you know, maybe one, uh, you know, for, for uh, chemically specific, material specific theory, for example, density functional theory, it's not a, a phenomenon that's easily accessible. Um, and so um, at the macro scale, um, you know, one can think about transport and kind of as, as a maybe in certain situations as a diffusive process where uh, of the order of a mean free path, there are scattering events by, by phonons and impurities. And that's one link scale um, where, uh, where we want to be studying things. Uh, another link scale uh, relevant to energy uh, is also the you know, kind of nanometer scale, uh, where uh, charge transfer processes can occur across interfaces. Um, and that's really related. And that is sort of more uh, we're there in that sort of case, the, the uh, processes that are relevant are more tunneling. And, and the sort of how the energies are uh, levels are aligned of these different entities, a molecule or surface, kind of dictates tunneling barriers and, and therefore uh, transport uh, efficiencies. And so these are kind of problems at different length scales um, that are both you know kind of uh, challenging but most important uh, uh, to uh, to understand in a kind of a chemically specific way. And I would argue, even though we have some in intuition, uh, for example, about at this. Uh, millimeter scale uh, about diffusive transport, for example, with effective mass theory, we don't really have a good chemically specific theory of relaxation times. Uh, similarly, although at the molecular scale we may be, you know, uh, our intuition tells us that, you know, if we have, you know, an interface like this, tunneling is going to be important. We don't really know um, how to align the levels or what this kind of, what sort of about this environment leads to a certain level alignment or tunneling barrier. Uh, to control uh, the efficiency of, of transport. And so there's really a need for kind of predictive uh, theories of, of, of tra charge transport carrier dynamics you know, at both of these link scales. And so part of what my group would like to do or, and is kind of working on is, is developing that. And I'll tell you a little bit, uh, you know, making some inroads in that direction. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the work that we're doing in two cases, um, one at this sort of uh, nanometer link scale where we're going to be focusing on tunneling and how you know we can describe that between uh, across heterogeneous interfaces in the context of uh, uh, molecular junctions and then I'll also tell you about uh, some of the work that we've just initiated um, where we're uh, in, in bulk semiconductors photoactive semiconductors where we're taught where we're interested in computing uh, sort of the, the cross section for scattering that lead to relaxation times uh, and mean free paths in bulk uh, semiconductor materials, uh, uh, sort of at the other end of the spectrum. And so I'll, uh, this is some work that we just started. And um, if, as long as the pace of my talk is, is, is fast enough, I will, I will get you 
uh, there and tell you about some of the, the exciting directions we're going in this space. Uh, but first, what I'm going to talk about is, um, is sort of this, uh, this tunneling limit um, and the kind of theory uh, that we've been doing there uh, and what we've learned about level alignment at these heterogeneous interfaces. Um, and so uh, now, of course, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, these hybrid interfaces between metal and molecule, there are a lot of different uh, situations, applications, where, where these, can, these such interfaces can be important in technology, uh, in batteries or uh, in, in dye-sensitized solar cells and other kinds of of energy related technologies. Um, and so um, the context that we're going to study these interfaces initially uh, is one where it's kind of a, it's a little bit Jules Verne, uh, but it's, a, it's sort of a, uh, it's in the, it's in the uh, sort of context of uh, molecular electronics or uh, nanoscale circuitry involving individual molecules. Um, and so in this context, you have a, a two leads uh, that are held at, at fixed chemical potentials. Um, and also at potentially different temperatures. And I'll talk about uh, you know, applying thermal gradients across the system, and then a molecule in between. And then one would like to, and then one can look at the current flow through that kind of system. Um, and of course, you know, a dominant mechanism, if the molecule is small, is going to be tunneling. And so that's what we're going to be studying. Um, and this is, uh, this is of interest to us because this is sort of a non equilibrium. Um, a problem and it involves an open system, and so it's kind of challenging for uh, uh, ab initio theory. Um, and so, to make progress in this area, in addition to uh, uh, sort of doing the theory, what we want to do is we want to have some validation studies, and there are ways of measuring these individual molecules between uh, electrodes. And so, one way, um, uh, and, and such uh, ways have kind of been introduced reliably and reproducibly, and such ways have been introduced about a decade ago. And so let me, and this is kind of a, a cartoon of one way you would measure it. You have a, a, a sort of a solution of molecules on a gold substrate, an STM tip, and then you kind of uh, repeatedly um, crash the tip and retract it from the substrate. Uh, and when you do that, you are kind of breaking and reforming gold point contacts. Um, and when you break the contacts in the solution of this, uh, uh, with these molecules, every once in a while, a molecule will fluctuate into the gap. And you'll kind of measure the, the transport properties. And as you continue to pull, of course, the molecule, uh, the junction will break. And so from such, kind of, from such measurements, you can get histograms that describe the average conductance of a molecule. So uh, this is sort of a, a, the kind of data that you would get from this sort of experiment. There's a, 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 um, uh, from repeatedly doing this experiment you know, tens of thousands of times. So you get a, a peak that's kind of your control that is basically the conductance. Well, conductance now is 1 over resistance, OK? Uh, conductance that is uh, at 1 g naught, which is e, 2e squared over h, which is the, the conductance of a single point contact. And you get that whether, uh, regardless of whether the solution has the particular molecule you're interested in, in this case, benzene diamine, or not. And then in this blue curve, uh, when the molecule is introduced, you get a, a peak that is well below 1 uh, g naught, so at lo a lower resistance. Uh, uh, that can be attributed to the molecule. And so several, this, this data um, uh, is sort of, this technique has been used by several groups, including, including Rachel Siegelman's group. Uh, and we're working with Rachel and, her, uh, and, and Will Chang on some measurements that are very similar to this, interpreting them uh, for another uh, application. Um, but these kind of measurements, uh, which started in 2006, gave us an opportunity to sort of you know, develop the theory uh, behind this tunneling transport. A uh, uh, quantitative theory behind that. Basically, th at that time, the name, what we were trying to do is understand why, for this particular molecule, was the conductance this value? Why did it have a spread of this much? Okay. Um, and so, um, because this, so what we're talking about is a small molecule uh, between two leads, and the dominant mechanism is tunneling. And so, basically, to describe this, to develop the theory of this, uh, there's really two main ingredients. One is um, uh, sort of a good hypothesis for the junction geometry, so how the molecule contacts the lead. Uh, so there's no kind of spectroscopy um, that, or, or, uh, or, or diffraction type measurement that can tell us the structure of the molecule. So one needs a strong hypothesis for the junction geometry. And then given that geometry, one needs a good theory of level alignment. So um, one can imagine, uh, the, this, so this is kind of an energy level diagram that typically describes this kind of 
junction, uh, it, it consists of a continuum of states that are associated with each contact and this discrete, level, discrete set of levels that are basically associated with the molecule. And so this is, for example, the homo resonance. And it's broadened by its coupling to the leads. And this is the lumo resonance. And this, uh, the, the, the sort of the distance between, or the energy separation of this lumo resonance relative to the Fermi energy, that's kind of like an effective tunneling barrier. And so our theory needs to be able to, again, starting with a strong hypothesis for a junction geometry, be pretty predictive of this barrier. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to be quantitative uh, for the, the conductance. And so uh, a lot of what we did initially, and I'll tell you a little bit about that work uh, briefly, um, is to just try to, it's to develop a theory to get this level alignment correct. Um, and you know, uh, the success for these junctions is just one example of, I think, where this theory can be applied. So it's kind of a, a general theory of, of you know, how uh, kind of quantitative theory of where levels line up uh, relative to uh, uh, electrodes. And I'll talk a little bit about that, OK? Now, um, it's, it, just to emphasize, it's important to get, you know, you know the, the geometry is very important here. Uh, it's important unknown. Um, uh, and because, of course, you know, how this molecule binds, it's just a molecule is going to dictate this level alignment. Additionally, um, given um, you know, a good theory of this, which you know, we kind of, uh, I'll talk about in a little bit, um, one can also start to ask, you know, what kinds of linkers, what backbone and contacts, one, um, you know, many of these are possible. In general, it's gold and, and some aromatic molecule with, with different linker groups. But if you ask like Guy Bazan and the chemists, one can make a lot of different molecules. Um, and so one, would, one can start to explore the sensitivity uh, of the chemical contact and composition to these barriers and start to develop some intuition for these you know, rather heterogeneous interfaces. So that's another goal of the work in addition to developing the theory. So let me just quickly describe, um, you know, kind of uh, given the diversity of the audience, I will just have a very, uh, you know, kind of a, a overview slide of, of the kind of work of the, uh, of the sort of the, the ingredients for our theory. Um, and I'll come back with a few more details a little bit later. Um, but basically, we would like to, we would like to uh, treat this system um, with chemical specificity. Um, it's a single molecule trapped between two leads. And so every atom counts. The identity of every atom counts. So one needs uh, a theory of chemi with chemical specificity. And so uh, the formalism of choice here is density functional theory. Uh, and, uh, and here, you know, we're talking about kind of state of the art DFT that involves uh, long range dispersion and at times hybrid uh, functionals. Um, and so given the complexity of this system, uh, those are still fairly challenging uh, calculations. But DFT is actually um, has one uh, important drawback that we can't really quite overcome, even if we're really at the state of the art. Uh, and that is static DFT is a ground state theory. And when you think about um, those resonances in the junction, those discrete resonance of the molecule, uh, they are electron addition and removal energies. And those are not ground state properties. Um, those involve, those are basically charged excitations. Uh, and so that's really uh, sort of out of the realm of DFT. So one has to add um, another ingredient. Um, one has to go beyond DFT to kind of build in the exchange and correlation effects that you know, uh, capture uh, the, the correct, uh, uh, you know, uh, quantitatively um, build in these exchange and correlation effects uh, that, that allow one to really treat those resonance levels, uh, understand them as electron addition and removal. And one uh, successful uh, approximation in the past that has been used uh, that builds on DFT is the GW approximation within many body perturbation theory. Um, so we're basically going to add, part of the work that we did was to add this in an approximate fashion to DFT for these junctions. Um, and that kind of, I'll talk a little bit about how we did that in an approximate way to get accurate level alignment. And then the final piece is that um, if we're talking about charge transfer, trans charge transport, we're really dealing with an open system. Uh, and, that, uh, and for that, we, we need to basically uh, use a, a different formalism that allows, so this system is really, it's uh, nearly f not finite, like you would you know, treat as a, uh, as a quantum chemist or, uh, or periodic, uh, as would be typical of a solid state physics calculation, uh, it's open. It's an open system. And so one needs a formalism that can, uh, that, that can handle that. And so we use this sort of ab initio Green's function formalism. And so for the experts out there, most of these calculations were done with a local basis set and siesta uh, and our own uh, code 
for doing uh, transport uh, with these approximate GW calculations. So let me tell you, let me walk you through a few uh, uh, early results that we had and show you some of the, the things that we've done more recently with these single molecule cir circuits and kind of show you what we can learn uh, by directly comparing with experiment um, about the physics of these junctions. Um, so one important thing that I was kind of emphasizing a couple slides ago is really the need to have a good hypothesis for the junction geometry. Um, and so um, there's a couple of, uh, uh, of points I'd like to make about that. So for what we do in, in constructing our geometries, and here's an example. This is basically benzene diamine. You're looking at the side of a benzene molecule with two amine groups. Um, and this particular kind of end group uh, is, is interesting and, and, and kind of important to sort of the early success of our method because uh, it turns out that this, this, uh, this end group binds to gold via donor acceptor mechanism and selectively binds really to undercoordinated gold. And so that limits the possible phase space of geometries that we, need to, that we, that we would need to explore. Um, and so basically we built geometries for the junction that had undercoordinated gold. Here you have a single ad atom, but one could also have surrounding this ad atom other ad atoms. Okay? One could coordinate that site a little bit more. Um, and, and basically that allowed us to, to kind of you know, start with a, you know, this strong hypothesis. And in our early calculations, we studied you know, a, around 20 or so different <coughs> geometries and studied the sensitivity of our, of our results to those uh, geometries. Um, and so um, this molecule does not bind very easily to a flat gold surface. Uh, it's just the nature of this donor acceptor bond. Of course, it can also lie flat on the surface, but you have to imagine there's another electrode on the other side. And so uh, it turns out that when it hops into the junction, it's going to be you know, at some angle or vertical. Uh, and if it's flat, then the conductance is, is very low. Okay, so this is really a result of this donor acceptor mechanism. Uh, there are other kinds of linkers that we've explored, uh, that have been explored experimentally, I'm sorry, that we've also studied. Uh, that, that really uh, have this donor acceptor mechanism. So this pyridine linker, this uh, so-called lock sulfide, this phosphine, methylphosphine uh, group, all of these things present uh, gold with this you know, lone pair. And you know, that um, is really kind of, that, that sort of kind of uh, builds in some selectivity. Um, and when, with these sorts of molecules, what you'll see in these uh, conductance histograms from experiment are really narrow uh, clearly identifiable peaks. <laughs> and they are in the same place every time you do the measurement and you know, roughly the same width. Okay? So, so this selective bond is, a, is an important part of uh, how we um, you know, kind of uh, started to work closely with experiment for these kinds of junctions. So starting with that hypothesis, I want to show you some of the results one gets that are related to transport uh, for these systems. And this is a, a, a kind of a result that's already about you know, seven years old, but uh, it's illustrative. Um, so this is a, this is a benzene diamine junction. Um, and you can see here, um, in this particular geometry, there's one gold ad atom here. And then here, there is another gold ad atom with some coordinated, with a, with, with a binding site that's coordinated by two other ones. You can't see the other gold atom. And what you can get out of this calculation, now this is an ab initio calculation, it's a DFT. Uh, plus uh, 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 non-equilibrium non Green's function is, is uh, a quantity transmission versus energy. So the transmission is basically the tunneling probability at a given energy. And in linear response, or the low bias limit, the tunneling probability at the Fermi energy uh, is proportional to the conductance. So that's the number that we're going to be comparing with experiment. And so you can see this transmission uh, function has this kind of uh, nice, smooth line shape. Uh, with peaks or resonances that are directly identifiable with the molecular levels of the molecular orbitals of the molecule. Uh, and this line shape is you know, referred to as a, as a Lorentzian line shape. Uh, and so this, uh, although we didn't assume that this line shape was Lorentzian, that's what kind of comes out of this system because the density of states of gold is very, very flat. Uh, and all the features in this probability or transmission are really coming from the molecule. Okay? Now, if you compare this number uh, times uh, the units that give you conductance to the experiment, you can see that we're off by about a factor of seven. Uh, and what is going on here is that this is the DFT result without any GW or self-energy corrections. And so uh, this vanilla DFT result basically places these resonances too close to the Fermi level. So just if you're familiar with uh, DFT and, and the band gap problem <laughs> with DFT, 
DFT predicts two small band gaps in solids. Here, um, and that basically results in the conduction band, the valence band, being too you know, close to you know, the like, mid-gap region. Uh, here, basically, you have resonances too close to the Fermi energy. And that's creating this problem. If you imagine pushing this resonance back um, you know, a little bit more, one could imagine getting this you know, into the tail of this curve in better agreement with the experiment. And so well, uh, you know, we could do that <laughs> but by some arbitrary not amount, but we, wanna, we wanted to kind of build a theory that would basically be parameter free that would tell us where that resonance ought to be. Uh, and so in order to do that, we had to think a little bit about you know, what uh, is the physics of level alignment. So let me just briefly go over that. So if I have a metal molecule contact, and here is my density of states. Here's kind of my energy level diagram and density of states of the continuum for the metal. And then here are my two molecular states. And I imagine bringing my molecule in from the gas phase. So in the gas phase, the homo and lumo level or um, uh, are kind of well defined. It has a, a homo lumo gap. And the homo level is basically the ionization energy. It's the energy to, required to remove an electron. Uh, the lumo, uh, the energy uh, required to uh, add an, or the energy gained by adding an electron. And if I imagine bringing this uh, uh, in, there will be, um, uh, when I bring the molecule and bind it to the surface, there'll be some charge rearrangement, charge transfer, that by Poisson's equation is going to generate a change in voltage, or a change in potential, um, and shift the levels relative to the Fermi energy, relative to the gas phase. Um, there'll be some hybridization that will broaden these levels. Uh, and then um, there'll be um, also a narrowing of this gap um, that's associated to uh, associated with kind of a, a polarization of the metal in the presence of these uh, uh, levels. So, so for example, if I add or remove an electron from a molecule at a surface, uh, there will be kind of an image charge like effect that will screen the resultant electron or hole left behind, uh, and that tends to 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 reduce the to narrow the gap. And so, in density functional theory, if I could just you know kind of go back here for uh, density functional theory tends to get this gap wrong because of the band gap. So this is predicted to be too high. Um, it tends to do pretty well with this uh, uh, potential, diff uh, the, the, this sort of interface dipole potential. Uh, the broadening, it tends to do OK. Um, but it also uh, misses this uh, renormalization of the gap associated with this non-local image charge-like effect. And so kind of thinking through this, uh, we basically knew what we had to do. We, ba we had to correct the molecule in the gas phase um, for, its ionization, for its gas phase ionization potential and, and electron affinity, and also build in this sort of static polarization effect. Um, and there's a question of you know, how important are these? How big of, you know, energetically, how big are these uh, effects? Uh, they're, they're quite big. They're, they're actually, for small molecules, they're, they're enormous. So for example, in the isolated molecule, this is sort of the electron, uh, the ionization potential electron affinity gap. Um, and this is in the gas phase. And when I put the molecule on the surface, uh, there's a change in about three electron volts. This is a benzene on graphite. So here are graphites, our proxy for a metal. But we have a small molecule benzene. If I put it on the surface, the change in this gap is about three volts. So it's an enormous change. Uh, and if I look at vanilla DFT, um, it doesn't capture this uh, environmental effect. So if I take this kind of flavor of DFT versus uh, gas phase or, or isolated molecule gas phase gap on the surface, it just doesn't distinguish between the two effects at all. So this, you know, three electron volt effect for small molecules, um, you know, order electron, a couple electron volt effect, is entirely missing. So that was the part we had to build in. Uh, from this initial set of studies, one thing we noted is that. Um, th for weakly coupled molecules, molecules that are kind of not, you know, whose orbitals are basically intact, you know, after adsorption, uh, one um, uh, can find one can actually uh, adequately model this effect with a classical electrostatics. So you know, so basically using this image charge intuition, um, and so that became the second ingredient to our model. And so just uh, I won't have a lot of equations in this talk, but just maybe one really quick. Uh, a couple few that I, I want to point out. So what we did is we, this is kind of how we did our GW calculation. Or, or we, we modified density functional theory. We basically added this correction that acts just on the molecule. Um, and um, the, the magnitude of that correction we developed through, you know, was, is basically, you know, empirical parameter free, specific to the junction. And it has two parts. It has this gas phase correction 
that corrects the, electron, the ionization potential and the electron affinity of the gas phase molecule. Make sure that comes out correctly. And then it has this electrode polarization correction that we sort of evaluate um, using a classical electrostatics expression, you know, via an image charge. Uh, and, and basically these two, and, and these things depend on, you know, the position of the molecule in the junction and the type of molecule that you're doing, and that's it. And they're, you know, fully determined. It's empirical parameter free. Uh, and this approximation really holds on, uh, if the orbitals of the molecule are really unchanged when it absorbs in the junction. Okay, and so we, we basically uh, did that, and here is the original resonance uh, that, we, uh, uh, that I showed you before. Uh, it's a little bit of a busy plot, but this red curve is the black curve I showed you before. The black curve is the corrected transmission function. Um, and you can see that this homo resonance shifts down quite a bit by two electron volts. Um, but the conductance that comes out of this uh, approach is much, much closer to experiment within about 20%. Uh, and one can, and so that's kind of the method that we use. Uh, and one can, and we have at this point kind of looked at, you know, 20 odd molecules. Uh, and so here is sort of the, the conductance computed with density functional theory. And, and here is with uh, this sort of modified uh, <coughs> approximate GW approach. And you can see that, you know, this is on a, a log scale. Um, and so uh, without uh, uh, sort of the, uh, the, the GW corrections, we're off by about an order of magnitude. And with, with the corrections, uh, you know, we're in the range of factor of two, factor of four. Okay? And uh, remember, we're comparing experimentally. Uh, and so you want to be on this line. But the line experimentally corresponds to a peak in a histogram. Uh, so uh, you know, there may be other reasons, that, other physics, uh, that they sort of you know won't allow us to get exactly on this line. So it's pretty good agreement uh, in the end um, for uh, aromatic molecules, uh, porphyrins, uh, alkanes. Okay, so we uh, further talk, so you know one kind of energy conversion. This is something that uh, Will and and Rachel and I and others are work Guy are working on um, is uh, converting you know a thermal gradient you know to um, a current. Uh, uh, through the thermoelectric effect. And so one can study that in these kinds of junctions. And so th it turns out that the thermal power, or the thermoelectric power, is related to the log derivative of this transmission function. So once you have that at the Fermi energy linear response, so once you have that, then one can, can compute uh, the thermal power. Uh, that's something that also can be measured, I'll mention before. Uh, and so the way to think about this quantity is that if I imagine biasing my system with a temperature gradient, uh, of course, all the you know, uh, electrons and holes are going to flow from hot to cold. Uh, and depending on uh, the, the shape of the transmission and density of states at the Fermi energy, there may be more electrons or more holes that are flowing from hot to cold. And that sets up a potential. Um, and that leads to this, uh, uh, that converts the heat into uh, elect electricity. Okay, and so, um, this kind of thing can be measured at the single molecule level. Uh, and so Rachel's group uh, was the first uh, group to, to measure this in a, in a molecular junction. This reference must be wrong, but this, this, the year is correct. Um, and one can also, uh, in, in subsequent measurements, one can uh, measure both the uh, uh, um, conductance and thermal power in a junction. And more recently, about uh, a couple weeks ago, this came online. Um, one can add a gate. And one, what, what has been seen in this measurement uh, is that by gating a molecular junction, both the conductance and the thermal power were uh, enhanced. And so um, if you know anything about thermoelectrics, the efficiency of a thermoelectric goes like uh, the square of the thermal power times the conductance. And so enhancing both of these at the same time is, um, is kind of interesting uh, and has been shown recently in these, at the single molecule level. Um, so we've also been, so we can do that for the junction, for uh, several junctions, and we have done that. Uh, and you can see that, again, these red dots are, are basically how our red data is how a, a well uh, shows that, you know, we can kind of compute this quantity reasonably well, uh, and the black is DFT. Uh, and you can see that these numbers are, are not earth shattering numbers uh, for, for the thermoelectric current. But in principle, there's really no bound on this quantity S squared G. Uh, so, um, you know, with some molecular engineering, that's something Will and Guy and Rachel are working on. One can imagine increasing this number quite a bit. And in terms of the thermoelectric efficiency, you know, one has to start looking at the thermal conductance of such junctions. Uh, that's a kind of a, a subject of future study. 
Um, but, but this sort of graph shows you that you know, we, can, we have this quantity you know, under reasonable control. Um, and maybe with a, um, uh, let me show you a couple more things uh, that we've done now that, you know, comparing with measurements of conductance and thermal power. Um, so one thing we wanted to do is I, I mentioned that, you know, um, you know, we were able to sort of uh, compare well with, you know, kind of explain these experiments by developing this theory of level alignment um, uh, for these hybrid interfaces between a molecule and a metal. Uh, what we we don't, ha this is kind of an indirect, you know, as indirect confirmation of this, uh, we see, you know, a good agreement between our conductance and the measured conductance. But we haven't done spectroscopy to see where the levels of the molecule actually are relative to the Fermi level of the, the gold. It's, again, it's just a single molecule, so that would be difficult. Uh, but one thing we can do if we have both uh, the conductance measured from uh, uh, a molecular junction, uh, and statistics on the uh, Sabak coefficient, thermal power s, um, is uh, and this is these are data for a molecule that has two peaks in its histogram, uh, bipyridine, and so you can see we have statistics and peaks for both the s and g. If we make an assumption about the shape of the conductance, uh, the transmission curve, uh, and we assume that it's Lorentzian, then um, then basically there are two free parameters: the width of the peak and the resonance, um, and s. And a measurement of S and G fully determine the full transmission function. And so experimentally, I can convert those histograms in S and G to the resonance position and its width. And I can compare that to theory. And so what we've done is, uh, in this study is, is basically this dotted line is the uh, Lorentzian that you get from taking the peak positions of the histogram uh, and assuming um, uh, uh, of, of, of measurements for these molecules um, in the two configurations, and the solid lines are the theory. And so you can see that this, uh, um, you know, our, uh, our resonance position is very consistent with uh, assuming this, because uh, in this case, the, the resonance is, it, that's relevant to the conductance is LUMO, it's closest to the Fermi energy. You can tell that that is, uh, uh, you can see that that, that, uh, that resonance is very consistent with the experimental prediction. Um, and so that's nice. Um, now, of course, uh, measurements of S and G do not uniquely determine the transmission if the transmission does not have this simple form. Uh, and so there are junctions where that's the case. And so uh, this mess, which I don't expect you to get through, but just remember the dotted lines are what you would get from uh, what experiment is predicting from the two histograms, and the solid lines is what's coming out of our calculation. The, these are the, the transmission curves that we're comparing for the same junctions. And you can see, interestingly, they cross right at the Fermi energy. So we're predicting the right conductance. Um, and interestingly, if you look at the, the thermal power, the, uh, this is the experimental conductance. This is the experimental thermal power. The data is right on top of uh, one another. But the shapes are not predicted correctly because in this case, the transmission is not Lorentzian. Um, it turns out if gold has a flat density of states, but about two volts below uh, the Fermi energy, you have D states. <laughs> And so the coupling is now strongly energy dependent, and you get a different uh, resonance function. And so uh, trying to interpret the data through a simple Lorentzian doesn't work um, in this particular case. Um, uh, I want to maybe, I'm, I'm going to run out of time, so I want to uh, mention, a, I'll mention this only briefly. Another way to explore this transmission function without um, assuming you know, shape of, anything about the shape of the transmission function is through an electrochemical gate. Um, and so uh, we, 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 were, we did a little bit of work on that uh, with the Venkataraman group. So this is sort of experimental data um, for different gate voltages, um, uh, sort of uh, where this junction experiment is done in the presence of this sort of uh, reference platinum electrode. Uh, and so you can see that we can uh, pretty well describe, this dotted line in this case is theory, we can pretty well describe uh, these small changes in the transmission function and explore that um, with the gate without making any assumptions about the Lorentzian model. Um, now, one thing I wanted to mention just to wrap up this part of the talk is that um, I talked a little bit about this beautiful transmission function that's Lorentzian form. Uh, and um, uh, there are um, ways we can explore, uh, sort of, we can kind of take advantage of the non Lorentzian form of the transmission function to do some, to, look, to, to kind of look at nonlinear effects in the uh, uh, electrical properties of these single molecule circuits. 
Um, and one nonlinear effect that's very interesting, you know, that kind of is rectification. Um, and so, in fact, the whole field of molecular electronics was kind of initiated with the idea that you know you could make a single molecule dino, diode by combining a donor acceptor uh, system uh, by uh, by bonding together a donor acceptor system. This is Avery and Ratner uh, about 40 years ago. Um, and Rachel's group uh, kind of did the the pioneering calculate uh, sort of measurement in this space, um, basically constructing a diode from uh, a donor acceptor system. Uh, and uh, and then you know there and, and so and, but however the rectification ratios in this space are not huge okay uh, pretty, pretty not spectacular for those interested in devices um, there are other ways one can make rectifiers one can take a symmetric molecule and basically uh, have asymmetric binding groups and so that has been done uh, in the literature as well uh, and so basically for rectification you want to generate an intrinsic asymmetry in some way. So that you know, forward current and reverse current are, are distinct. And so these are, are ways of, of building that in, either through the backbone or through uh, asymmetric linkers. Um, another way would be a, uh, asymmetric electrodes. And that's what I wanted to talk about, uh, which I think is kind of an interesting recent work. Uh, um, so what we, what, here what we've done is um, replaced one of the gold electrodes in this experiment with graphite. And basically, graphite is this sort of very robust uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of electrode, um, and uh, sort of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, I guess it's fashionable to talk about graphite as really a stack of graphene, stacked graphene. Uh, so maybe we could talk about it that way. But it's interesting to think about it that way, because uh, one could imagine replacing this graphite with other two-dimensional materials suitably stacked. Uh, and so that kind of work is in progress. But what's interesting about this system is that it has a very non-constant density of states near the Fermi level. So you're certainly not going to see uh, a transmission profile or Lorentzian-like uh, transmission behavior. Maybe one can look at that and use that for rectification. So let me talk about that. So, so here is kind of the experiment. And so here we're, it's a, we're looking at this data a slightly different way. This is conductance now on the y-axis and displacement on the x-axis. And so you can imagine. Um, uh, now the junction being pulled apart, uh, this value is basically the uh, gold graphite contact conductance. And you can see that this is a log plotter. It's hard to see, but you can kind of see that there's some variation here. Um, there's some structure in this peak. And this, this can be interpreted um, as kind of you know, picking up this molecule uh, and uh, finally extending it and breaking uh, the molecule uh, 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 a sort of metal bond. Um, and so we, we modeled this system um, basically with a series of static con uh, calculations at different uh, angles um, with the, the approach that I, that I mentioned. Um, and so this is the transmission function that comes out. It's kind of interesting. And remember, the system is asymmetric, so it has uh, different leads um, uh, on either side. Um, and so here we're just talking, we're going to just talk about linear response uh, um, conductance first, and then we'll talk about current. But you know you have this uh, peak, but then of uh, this very non-Lorentzian behavior near the Fermi energy. So you have kind of a, a peak that you know can be associated with the home of the molecule, but then this kind of dip here, uh, and this peak does not go to unity as you would expect in an asymmetric junction. And if you look near the Fermi energy, and again that's really relevant to the conductance. That's the part of the, the transmission that's relevant to the conductance. The shape here is dominated by the density of states of graphite, uh, which has the, a very non-constant behavior uh, near uh, zero, as we well know. Okay, and so, so this is so this is a case where um, really the transmission function is a convolution of this resonance and the graphite density of states, um, and one can study that and see that as you kind of pick the molecule up, um, and the molecule starts to become less and less coupled to the graphite, that um, the, uh, the the this peak. Uh, that the, the, the coupling on either side becomes really more and more asymmetric as evidenced by the lowering of this resonance peak even further from unity. Uh, and so one can study that. I'm going to skip this slide in detail. One can actually study how the different electronic couplings on either side of the molecule uh, vary with energy and uh, angle. Um, and so if you look now near the Fermi energy, one sees, uh, you know, again, this very so this is kind of a blow up of the transmission function near the Fermi energy for this, this, the molecule between gold and graphite as opposed to gold gold. You can see for gold gold, the uh, transmission function is relatively fat, flat, but for um, sort of gold graphite, there's a lot of structure. 
within um, about 5 volts of the, uh, 0.5 volts of the Fermi energy. And the current that you get out of the system is really the integral under this curve. Um, but the, the way you do the integral uh, depends on where the voltage drops. Um, and basically 40% of the drop of the voltage is really only 40% is on the graphite side. So it turns out from a, a calculation. And in the, in the gold BDA gold uh, case, the gold voltage drop is symmetric as the junction is symmetric. And so one has to open this bias window asymmetrically. Uh, and one opens it in a different, uh, you know, in this way for forward and in the opposite for uh, reverse. And so the areas under the curve are different. Um, and, um, you know, the areas are very sensitive to the shape of this curve. And that kind of gives you the, the, the sort of rectification in this particular case. Um, and this is just to show you that, you know, the calculated conductance values that we get are within the experimental range. Uh, and uh, this is describing the forward and reverse uh, sort of regions of this transmission function that we're going to explore. Uh, this shows a histogram for forward and reverse, and you can see they're, they're, the conductance values are clearly different. Um, and basically, this table describes uh, sort of our, 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 our capturing the rectification ratios, which is on the order of, of three in this case. Um, but what this kind of does, uh, this study is interesting, I think it does, is it kind of gives you another component to design and you know, directed energy flow in these single molecule circuits, the, the electrode, the nature of the electrode um, as, a, as, a, as a parameter that we can use to kind of further explore um, you know, and, uh, uh, circuits that uh, potentially have larger rectification ratios. That's, a, I think, a big question right now is why are these so small and how can we make them bigger? Okay, and so um, just to kind of summarize this, um, uh, th that's kind of, this kind of summarizes this uh, section of my talk. And with the remaining five minutes, if I can just take a few more minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about recent results we have on, um, uh, we've been doing on bulk carrier transport. Um, and so, you know, that we, here we've been studying kind of at the nanometer scale, the tunneling limit. Uh, let's talk about uh, the diffusive limit. Um, and in particular, in the context of, of silicon uh, and gallium arsenide. But, but let's focus on silicon given the, the time constraints. And so again, what we want to do is we want to be able to describe transport in silicon, uh, uh, you know, given a population of electrons in the conduction band, um, without you know uh, resorting to empirical parameters, um, and one of the motivations for doing this would be um, trying to understand better and control thermalization loss in solar cells. So if you look at a solar cell, um, a, a typical single junction solar cell, the Shockley Quiser limit is 33 percent, um, and so you know all of this. Uh, sort of in this nice review by Harry Atwater, all of, uh, all of the sort of, uh, the, the sort of uh, 67 percent is lost for various reasons. Um, some of it has to do with the finite band gap that's required, of course. Um, but a good chunk, in fact, most of it uh, is lost due to thermalization. So basically, this is sunlight absorbed above the band edge that kind of thermalizes down to the band edge. And so it would be interesting to, to kind of do something with these hot carriers, of course. Um, and so here what I'm going to do is just, show, just kind of describe this thermalization process. Um, and so, uh, and we're going to do that in a couple, with a couple, by including a couple of mechanisms. Um, so one primary mechanism of, of hot carrier thermalization uh, is the electron, phone, is electron phonon scattering. Um, and uh, a typical uh, energy scale for this is about uh, that of an optical phonon in silicon, um, 50 MeV. Uh, and the typical time scale is, is going to be less than a picosecond, um, a much a less than a phonon cycle. Uh, another uh, mechanism, uh, and, and, and we're talking about uh, solar uh, absorption, so in this particular case we're talking about a low density limit, uh, is electron-electron scattering. Um, and in particular, impact ionization. So this is a process by which a, uh, an electron, you know, it's you know, far above the, the band edge, um, can kind of, you know, kind of uh, spontaneously drop down to the band edge um, and generate another, uh, 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 and excite um, another electron at the valence band edge. Um, so at, so, so for kind of at, at low density, this kind of effect is, is a little bit less important. But we'll, we'll calculate this and talk about that. Um, now what we're going to do is, we're, for the moment, we're going to neglect impurity and defect scattering because uh, um, you know, that's sort of uh, a, a little bit more challenging, and we're going to kind of reserve that for future work and see how far we get with these two processes. 
And so um, you know, maybe, sorry about, uh, this is a little bit aggressive uh, equation-wise, but just to kind of give you a sense for how we're doing this, um, the main thing to say is that we're doing this perturbatively. Uh, so we're incorporating electron-phonon interactions perturbatively, um, uh, integrating over the entire Brun zone. Uh, and, and basically, we are uh, uh, through a kind of, uh, by constructing a self-energy, and we're going to use this imaginary part of the self-energy, which is a scattering rate, to construct uh, the relaxation time. The other component we're going to get uh, from a, this impact ionization or the electron-electron interaction we're going to get from GW. Okay, and so we're going to get these two rates, and then we're going to um, add the rates <laughs> and then invert them to get a relaxation time. And remember, we're going to calculate this for every band and for every K point in the zone. Um, and then we'll just integrate this simple Boltzmann equation for occupation factors uh, to look at the carrier dynamics. Okay, and so just a few results before I wrap up. There's just a couple more slides. Um, this is for silicon um, at 300 Kelvin. And, and here is sort of the total imaginary part of the, or well, this is the broken down into electron phonon, electron, electron, imaginary uh, part of the self energy, so the scattering rate, uh, scattering rate. And we plot that right, on, uh, right next to the electronic density of states. And what you can see, is that at each energy there's a spread, and that's associated with the fact that the electron phonon interaction has a different strength depending on what k point you are in the zone. Um, and for the electron phonon interaction, it closely follows the electronic density of states. So it's kind of really driven by this phase space. The uh, electron electron part of the scattering rate um, is basically negligible until you get to about a band gap above the. Uh, a band gap of energy above either of the band edges, and then it starts to turn on, as expected. Uh, but it's much, uh, but even when it turns on, it's much less of a, of a, of a factor than the electron phonon part. So, so this electron, this kind of plot tells you the main contribution to the relaxation time is the electron phonon. Uh, uh, so it's basically emission of phonons. Now, one can look at the inverse of this quantity, and as expected, uh, and then get out the relaxation times. Uh, and so as expected near the band edge, because you can see uh, <laughs> this uh, scattering rate is going uh, to zero, the relaxation time is going up, up, up. And so it's very, it, so basically the dynamics from this, uh, you can read from this, is that you basically have fast dynamics until you get within a half a volt of the band edge, and then things slow down dramatically. And the time sco scale right here is about 10 femtoseconds, and up here we're talking about ten, hundreds, on the order of hundreds of femtoseconds. So one can also, um, I can compare this with the uh, experiment in a second, one can also compute a mean free path um, uh, by taking a, a sort of a Fermi a, a velocity at each uh, d, d, k at each uh, a k point multiplied by this calculated relaxation time. And you, know, you can kind of see, so you get some interesting trends out. I won't go over this in detail, but one can look at different uh, high symmetry directions and at holes in electrons. And what one can see is that at 300 Kelvin, um, independent of what direction you're in, blue, uh, gray, or, or red, uh, the mean free paths are on the order of about 10 uh, 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 nanometers. As you get uh, much closer to the band edge, those mean free paths go up, up, up. And then finally, at the, at the band edge, they drop down to zero because the velocity is zero. Um, on the other hand, for electrons, for hot electrons, the mean free paths Seem to have um, seem to be larger for the one 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 zero zero direction. So, um, sort of, uh, if one wanted to connect this to real life, maybe what this is telling us is that if I could, uh, you know, structure my nanowire um, in such a way, you know, if I was using a nanowire to harvest solar energy, if I could structure in a way to extract, um, you know, uh, carriers, it would be wise to have it, you know, extract along this direction, and it'd be uh, good to have the dimensions in the five to ten nanometer range. And then maybe I could get hot carriers out of it. Okay. So this is the kind of information one can get. Um, and then maybe just to skip this, because I know I'm running out of time, um, one can also look at the population dynamics um, you know, with the simple Boltzmann equation approach given these relaxation times. And so here is, a situ here is kind of uh, an initial condition that we give uh, uh, the population dynamics. So this is sort of the related to AM 1.5 solar flux. Uh, and then uh, this is the final thermalized Fermi-Dirac kind of population. Uh, and one can look at how, as a function of time uh, and energy, 
and, and each of these curves is at a different time, uh, these carriers that are initially at zero femtoseconds, you know, uh, distributed like this, uh, gradually evolve into at 250 femtoseconds this sort of Fermi Dirac distribution. Um, and so from this uh, from this sort of uh, analysis, this ab initio analysis, one can get um, roughly a, a, a 250 femtosecond you know uh, thermalization time that is you know uh, consistent with um, uh, uh, sort of uh, pump probe measurements uh, that have been have been done. Uh, and so that's kind of so this is kind of promising. This tells us that you know with sort of uh, uh, non empirical ingredients that we can kind of describe these the uh, you know processes relevant to hot carriers and their relaxation time. And so one of the things um, you know I would we're we're thinking about now um, is you know what other material space could we apply this to? So certainly here um, just and this is the last slide I've got. Uh, you know, you, you have uh, some, a lot of interesting heterostructures with, with interesting mobilities uh, that have been um, uh, discussed. There are the organic systems um, and, and other kinds of uh, uh, solar cell or the organic perovskites. And so kind of one of the things we can do with this method is, is provide, you know, for these kind of defect-free samples, upper bounds of what the intrinsic mobility might be. Uh, now, of course, there are, we're, we're making some assumptions about the mechanism here. Uh, and in particular, we're in this kind of uh, Druda uh, uh, sort of uh, limit um, where, you know, probably small polarons are not going to be captured. Um, but this is a good starting point for really understanding bulk transport, I think, in, in these kinds of complex materials. So let me just thank my group again. Uh, and in particular, uh, Michelle Kachuga, Jean Fei Lu, Marco Bernardi, who did the bulk of the work that I discussed here, my collaborators, uh, and the funding agencies, Department of Energy, uh, AFS uh, Air Force Murray, uh, the Molecular Foundry, and um, uh, the uh, uh, Israeli S uh, uh, Science Foundation. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Great talk. Lots of